of this economic reality. So Greg, really pleased to have you come in and talk to us about profitable hay feeding days in cow cow farm. Board. Greg? Okay. All right, good morning. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, just to get us going here, and, and I think I've tried to dumb this down just a little bit so that there, there isn't too much uh, numbers. There will be numbers. And by the way, before I forget, in your proceedings, you should have almost all the slides. So if, if you want to follow, take notes, uh, you have it in there. So let's get going here. <clears throat> this is what, you know, what the, the, the main part of, of what we're here today is, we're, we're trying to, or most of us are trying to learn how can we extend the grazing season. Um, and I'm all for that. And, and like Ray said, what I'm, my focus is if we're going to do it, let's make sure we can do it profitably. And, and so we will we'll look at a number of different scenarios. We'll, we'll even look at hay costs. Um, and we'll try to come up with a number of different scenarios so you can kind of choose which one is most representative for your farm. Um, and, and see based on that where you should probably be in terms of total hay feeding days. So I always like to start off by talking about what do you do if, if you're looking at extend, extending the grazing season, how do you go about doing that? Um, and I like to think about an analogy of, of picking fruit off a tree. You're always going to start where? Kind of low-hanging fruit, right? And so what is that proverbial low-hanging fruit for a grazing operation? And You'll see a number of pictures from my farm in southern Woodford County here, but, but this is just good basic rotational grazing to kind of get started. What, what Jim Garrish uh, kind of focused on his first book, Management Intensive Grazing. So that's probably low-hanging fruit where we can potentially both increase stocking rate and probably reduce hay feeding days at the same time. But that's the low-hanging fruit, and we quickly run out of that. So what do we go to next? So we, we pick all the low-hanging fruit, and there's... There's more than just that. I'm, I'm just showing that as, as one option. Um, so this would be kind of, for me, the getting up higher in that grazing tree. So this is actually mid-December. This is in Southern Woodford County. Um, and what you see here is, is we're getting a little more intense with our, with our grazing moves at this point. In other words, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a, squeeze a few more grazing days out of this pasture. But to do it, you can see it's requiring what? A little bit more management, right? A little bit more labor to do it. We're becoming a little more intense. Is there a cost to doing that? Yes. Um, and we've got to balance that cost with the benefit of those additional grazing days. Um, and by the way, I really do try to push the limits in terms of how far I can extend the grazing. Um, and this is an example of that. Just, has anyone seen that mechanism there? It's a bat latch, right? And, and essentially what that is, it's an automatic timer. You can set it for, I think, up to two weeks in advance. We usually do it, you know, one or two or three days out. But basically when, when that timer goes off, you have a cam that turns 90 degrees, and you can see it releases what? That handle and spring, it pulls back, and the cattle train themselves that real quick, and they essentially let themselves in the next paddock move. But there's a cost of that. It's $400. So for a lot of folks, that's too high in terms of, of that great, you know, too high of a fruit for them to pick. I actually find that is one of the most useful tools in our farm uh, because it, it really cuts down on labor. So, and different farms are going to have kind of different levels of, of where that low hang, you know, middle hanging and high hanging fruit are. But at some point, you kind of exhaust all those those options, and you've put you've pushed it to the limit in terms of you know, where the cost is exceeding the benefit, and there's only one thing left you can do to extend the grazing season. What is it? It's, it's by the way, the, probably the most costly thing that you can do. So just hypothetically, let's say this on a 50-acre farm or so, and we've got 20 cows out there, and, and we're down. We've, again, this is a good grazing farm. We've done everything we can to kind of extend the grazing season, and right now we're feeding, let's say, 90 days. If I want to get that down to 45 days, what, what's the only thing I can do now? Remove some cows, right? So I, I just destock by 25%. I want to get that down to zero Haiti feeding days. What am I going to have to do? Cut a few more cows, right? We sometimes don't want to admit that but because there's no free lunch here, but at some point, that's your final option. What's the cost of that? Well, I've got half as many calves to sell, right? And so that, that's the cost to doing that. 
So before we kind of get dug into the details, let's just think about this kind of bird's eye view, kind of big picture. So what I have here, I just want you to think conceptually, we're going to look at just two simple scenarios with hay cost, a low cost hay scenario and high cost hay scenario. And on the left hand side, this is kind of the base profitability of your operation. So we'll look at a situation where it's very low profit and, and a situation where it's very high profit. And we'll take the two extremes. So let's say we've got a high hay cost. Let's say that's $50 for a five by five bale, so $100 a ton roughly for your hay. And on the left hand side, we've got low profit. So let's say uh, you're selling calves for a dollar a pound. So if you're selling calves for a dollar a pound and you had a really high hay cost, would you want to have a bunch of cows and feed a lot of hay, or would you want fewer cows and feed no hay? I think you'd want fewer cows, low stock rate, right, in that situation. Now, let's look at the other extreme. So low hay costs and high profits. So let's low hay costs, you've got a neighbor that's selling you hay cut in mid-May for $20 a roll, $40 a ton for five by fives. And let's say for high profit, this is back in 2014, you're selling calves for $250 a pop. Do you want to have a whole bunch of cows on that farm, even though you've got to feed a lot of hay? You're darn right you would, right? So that would be the other extreme. You'd want a very high stocking rate in that situation, and you're going to feed a lot of hay, right? Because you can pay for that hay with those calves. Now, where are we now? We're, not, we're somewhere in between those, those two scenarios, and that's what we're going to focus on the rest of the day. I'm going to try to give you scenarios that, that you can pick that probably mat, hopefully match your farm. And again, you can hopefully figure out where should you be roughly in terms of how much hay uh, should you feed. Uh, to do that, I'm going to have two different stocking scenarios, and I'll explain why here in a minute. Um, and by the way, just before we get into this, this is, these are both assuming that we've, we've got really good management. So in other words, we've picked the low-hanging fruit, the, high, the middle hanging fruit, and the high-hanging fruit. So this would not be for continuous grazing. This would be for someone like a lot of folks here right now. Um, we're doing everything we can to kind of extend the grazing season and do everything right. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a bunch of these. That's how many hay feeding days that you're going to have. So everything from, from five months, 150 days, down to zero in essentially one-month increments. And then you're going to have the stocking rate, number of cows for a 100-acre farm, and then total hay fed on, a, on how many tons of hay for that entire herd that you have. So let's start with stocking rate number one. Uh, so to feed hay for five months out of the year, we're going to have 57 cows. Again, that's pretty good soil with really good management. So think of it that way for all these. So again, what, so in other words, we've picked all the, you know, the reasonable fruit we're going to do here in terms of that grazing tree. So what do we've got to do now to, to reduce our hay feeding days? We've got to reduce our stocking rate, right? And so we're just going to keep dropping. So we've dropped down to 41, 34, 28 down to about 24 cows uh, compared to that 57 that we started with. So that's the cost of doing that. The benefit is we're going to, in that bottom scenario, we're going to feed zero, you know, we're going to feed no hay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to present one other scenario here, and the reason I'm doing this is we don't know exactly where it's going to be. So I'm giving you two different scenarios that you can pick from. I'll give you my opinion on the two here in a minute. Basically, all it does is, is we're, we're cutting fewer cows as we go down in terms of hay feeding days, just a little bit slower. So we have 28, 29 cows in instead of 24. Um, so this is something I've added the last year when I presented last year in Missouri. We, I talked to them about this, and, and so we had these adjustments here. So, so one advantage to, to feeding less hay, at least on average, is, is most hay better or lower quality, at least in this area, compared to a good stockpile in the wintertime. Usually a stockpile is going to be a little bit better, not always, and if we have really hard freezes like we had a couple of years ago after that second one, the quality declined, but on average it usually is. So on average, the, the, the fewer amount of hay that we feed, we're probably going to have some forage quality improvements, which will translate into performance improvements for the cow. So what I'm doing, or what I've done, is essentially bump the weaning rate up from starting at 85% up to 87 as we decrease hay feeding days. And then on the weaning weights, we're going to increase those. So we start out 525, and we're going to up that up close to 10%, up to 565 as, as we're feeding close to no hay, if that makes sense. In terms of hay cost, um, we're going to look at three different 
what I call net hay values, and I'll explain that in a minute. So you got $40 a ton, $60 a ton, and, and $80 a ton. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take what that hay cost is, or the price you buy it for, subtract out whatever nutrient value that you're getting on your farm, and we'll explain what I mean by that here in a minute. Not necessarily what's in the hay, but what you're getting recycled back on your pasture hay ground. So give you a couple examples. So let's say the, the net co or the cost of the hay delivered $70 a ton, or that you can make it for that. Let's say you, you've estimated that you've got $10 a ton of nutrient value in that in terms of how it's fed, your net hay cost would be the difference, those two or $60 a ton. Now, what do you use for that net nutrient value? That's what we'll very quickly talk about. So what kind of nutrient value does it look like we're getting here in this picture? Is it good or bad? Doesn't look very good to me. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the details here of how I'm coming up with these, that's a whole nother uh, talk, but, but probably $5 a ton is all they're getting in terms of net nutrient value out of that hay. Most of it's being concentrated where? Right around where it's being fed. It's not being spread out. So in that situation, this is just an example, if, if the original cost of the hay was $85 a ton, if all we're getting back is $5 a ton in terms of fertilizer value, our net hay cost is $80 a ton. Now let's look at another example. Um, this is bale grazing. Who here has, has seen or does bale grazing? I, I know there's a few. There's a couple I've worked with here. By the way, I'm not going to spend much time on this or really any time, but if, if you're interested, Dave, raise, raise your hand. I've worked with Dave here this last winter. If, if you're interested, you know, I'm probably biased on bale grazing, but if, if you want to get the real scoop, talk to Dave here uh, sometime today. And Dave has become an advocate, I think I can say, with bale grazing. But can you all see how that might work? Basically, it's rotational grazing of, of bales. And if you do it right, you'll actually have a good stockpile in there at the same time, so they're getting a little bit of both. Um, so let's fast forward here. This isn't the exact spot. This is a farm I've been working with for about five years, cow-cat farm. This next slide is on the same farm, different location. Uh, but you can see, does that look like we've got pretty good nutrient distribution? Yeah. And I can easily pence out about 20 to $25 a ton in terms of the value in that. And so if we have that same $80 cost, subtract $20 from net hay cost now is what? $60 a ton. So in other words, that, that's the value you'd use on the tables I'll show you. If we got hay for really cheap, let's say $30 a bale for five by five bales, we're down to $40 a ton for that net hay cost. Our additional costs, I'm not gonna spend much time here. Um, I've got the details in the proceedings, um, but basically, when, you, when we think about additional costs, we're just gonna think about as we increase or, or decrease cows on this farm, what costs are gonna change? So first of all, if we've got a 100 acre farm, and let's say we go from 40 to 30 or 30 to 40, our land cost isn't gonna change, right? We still have that 100 acre farm, so we don't have to worry about land cost. Um, what costs are gonna be big ones that change? Obviously, hay costs, in other words, the more cows we have, higher hay costs. Uh, cow depreciation, interest, that's gonna be an obvious one. What about labor? If, if, if I double, and, and actually Jim Garrish talked about this, if I double the number of cows on that farm, is my labor going to double? No, it's not even going to come close, right? Because it's just about as easy to move 40 cows as it is 20. In fact, it is. It's just we'll have to check them, maybe not check them as much, but when we go to check calves, that sort of thing, we'll spend a little bit more time. Uh, so I've tried to adjust for all that, and, and this, that would be the total cost that I have. Again, I'm not going to spend much time on that. We'll, we'll actually change that later on. And that would be the cost side. So in other words, what I'm trying to get at here is we need to figure out kind of our gross profitability of the operation, right? So we've got the cost side. What's the other side of the equation for profitability? Be the revenue side, right? So what I'm assuming here is, is you know, five, this would be for a steer heifer average, 525 pounds, $1.50 um, sale price. So this, this is a little bit higher than where we're at right now. Uh, but a year ago, that's about where we're at. We're going through a transition period with a big fire out in Tyson plant, so all the cattle marks have kind of tanked for a little bit. But that's what I'm looking at in terms of long-term pricing and 85% weaning rate. So now we're going to go to the results, and this is where we'll have tables you can kind of pick through. So first of all, any questions up to this point? All right. So let me explain the table here. So on the left, that would be the number of hay feeding days, the stocking rate, and I wouldn't pay that much attention to the stocking rate, I'd pay more attention to the hay feeding days. <laughs> Up on the top, that will be your net hay cost, your adjusted hay cost, so the, the cost of the hay minus nutrient value, so 40 60 or $80 a ton. 
Um, and we'll start with scenario number two, and then we'll go to one. So let's start with, four, so just first off, if hay is really cheap, just intuitively, are, are we going to want to have more cows or less cows? We're going to want more and, and feed more hay, right? Uh, so on that left-hand side, do you think the optimal number is going to be towards 150 hay feeding days or zero feeding hay feeding days? Probably the 100 towards 150. It's not going to be 150, but up towards that. So let me explain how this works. Everything's going to be relative to that 150 hay feeding days, and I'll explain that in a minute. So, for instance, if, if you were moving from 150 hay feeding days to 120, so five months to four months, your, your profit would increase by $300. So not that much, 100 acre farm, not a big deal. Um, if you went from 150 hay feeding days to 90 hay feeding days, your profit would increase by about $600. Again, not a huge deal, but that's actually where we're most profitable there. Now, what about if we were at zero hay feeding days? In other words, we're stocked low, we weren't feeding any hay, I've got a negative number down there. What does that mean? It means relative to 150 hay feeding days, we lost $1,600. Now, if we compare against the 90, so in other words, if I compare the 90, which is, is our optimal right there, versus zero hay feeding days, how much did I lose relative to the where I was most profitable? It'd be the absolute difference, right? Or how much? $2,200. So in other words, if I went from 90 hay feeding days down to zero, I'm actually losing about $2,200. Doesn't mean I lost that much total, but if, if I made $3,000 at 90 days, I made how much total profit at zero? About $800. Does so everyone see how that works? All right, so from this point onward, just for time's sake, I'm going to go through fairly quickly, and I'm just going to highlight about where the best, you know, within a few hundred dollars, where the best point to be in that particular uh, point of the table. So at $40 per ton hay, you'd want to be somewhere between, what, 90 and 120 days if, if your net hay price was that low, which probably isn't, is going to be very few people. So as we move up in hay price, what's going to happen? We're going to want to feed what? Less hay, right? And that's going to kind of move down. So as we go to six, or, or when we go to sixty dollars per ton net hay cost, our optimal point now is what? About thirty to ninety days of hay feeding. Do you all see how this is working? All right. What about eighty dollar ton hay? Where do you think that optimal point is going to be now? It's going to be down real low, right? So there's a situation where literally zero hay feeding days is, is about where you want to be, or somewhere close. 30 or 60 doesn't really matter. They're all about the same. And if we put them all together, that's essentially where... So if, if you believe that stocking rate is, is where you're at in terms of how quickly it goes down or, or how slow it goes down, you'd use that table and all you'd have to figure out is, is what net hay price do I want to use after I adjust for, for that nutri nutrient value of the hay. All right, any questions up to this point? I have a little bit, Bill, but that would be another hour here. So the short answer is I don't have time to go into that, but I have. And that will change it. And for some folks, it will make sense to do annuals. Absolutely will. You wouldn't want to do it just with winter. You'd have to do a double crop situation to make it work. You'd have to have a summer annual followed with winter annual. But for some folks, that, will be, that would be the, the best route to go. Uh, so without getting going into too much detail, the answer is, yeah, I've looked at it. I, I can't present it here because we don't have another hour to do that. But I'd be glad to talk to you about that. Yep. Then right there, that's absolutely right. So it's not saying you're, you made $5,000 profit. If you lost 10000 here, you made how much here? It's the difference between the two. Yeah, the delta. All right, so that's the second stocking rate scenario. So now we'll look at the first one. So here, basically, it's going to be a little more costly to get down to zero hay feeding days, right? Because we've got to destock a little bit quicker. So basically, that's going to have the, the impact of, of shifting everything up a little bit in terms of where those optimal uh, hay feeding days are. So again, I'm just going to go through quickly and highlight. So in that situation, really cheap hay, 
we'd want to be up in 120 to 150 hay feeding days. But again, most folks aren't going to be in that situation. That's really cheap hay. Or, or we're getting really good nutrient value out of that hay. There's $60 per ton hay. Where do we want to be there? Somewhere between 90 and 120 days. And, and more expensive hay, $80 per ton, somewhere in the 30 to, to 90 days. So again, it's, it's kind of shifted everything up just a little bit. Now, so what is the mo what, what, are, what are the ideal hay feeding days? Or, or you can think about stocking rate. The answer is what? It, it the answer is what? What's, what's the optimal number of hay feeding days? It what? It depends. It depends on the situation. Now, again, I gave you two different scenarios. There's number two. There's number one. Which one is most accurate? We don't have any research, and we'll never have re good research to say which is most accurate. This really is just my compilation of, of talking to a lot of people that are, that are striving for zero hay feeding days, finding out what they had to do to reach that. Um, and I still don't know which is the best. So I'm giving you two scenarios. Don't know which one's the best. But what I'm going to do next is simply I'm going to average two. In other words, I don't know which is the best. We're just going to average two very quickly. So here's, here's number two. Here's number one. Now, I'm going to explain this in a second here, but I'm actually going to include that minus 300. I'm going to go down. I'll explain it in five minutes why I did that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the overlap between number one and number two, and it's right there. So 90 to 120 days is, is our overlap. So for really cheap hay, somewhere between 90 and 120 days is probably what you want to target. Here's $60 per ton hay. There's two. There's one. Again, I'm going to drop this. I'll explain it in five minutes why I'm doing that. And where the overlap is, it's right there, 60 to 90 days. And $80 per ton hay, there's number two, there's number one. We've got the overlap 30 to 60 days. So if you're like me, you don't know what scenario is best, I would just simply average the two. Just use that table. Now the question is, what's your net hay price, right? You've got to figure that out. For most folks, I'm going to say it's probably right there in the middle. And so you probably want to target 60, 90 days. But if you've got good records of costs, if you're buying and you know what you're getting in terms of nutrient dis distribution, you, can, you might be somewhere different. OK, questions up to this point, and then I've got, we've got plenty of time, actually. We have any questions up to this point? And then we're going to talk about hay costs, if you're making hay. All right, good. We've, and we've got till 10.15, right? Okay, we've got plenty of time. It's good. So here's a question I get a lot is, well, and, and Jim, by the way, Jim is, is correct. Most folks that make their own hay aren't anywhere close to what they should be in terms of cost. And, and I routinely work with people when, when I sit down, it's clear their costs, overall costs are well above $100 a ton. And I don't disagree with Jim. There probably are some folks that are above $200 a ton. In those situations, what, what is always the number one problem in terms of where their costs are, are out of hand? It's always this one, one portion of their costs. It's machinery. In other words, they've got 30 or 40 cows, and they've got $100,000 in haymaking equipment. The only way that they can justify is, is if they had 200 or 300 cows. And I, that's a whole other presentation. That's an hour-long presentation, so I'm, I'm not going to go into details. But short answer is they're overcapitalized. And their biggest cost, they have too much machinery. The problem is, even if they have really high overall hay costs because of the machinery, unless they get rid of all that machinery, it's not going to help them a whole lot. And I'll show you why. So let me explain what's going on here. Um, and this is kind of, this is one scenario I show, I'll, and again, it's part of a, a long presentation. This is how much hay that, that if you're making hay with $60,000 initial hay equipment, um, this is how much hay that you're producing per year. So 500 tons, again, five by five bale, if it weighs around 1,000 pounds, that would be 1,000 five by five bales. So in other words, it's a pretty big, pretty big operation to make 500 tons of hay. On the left-hand side, that would be total depreciation interest put on a per ton basis. So just, just for clarification, if let's just say that our overall hay costs are $100 a ton. If we've got $50, or let's not say this, it, let's say that, that hay is valued at $70 or $80 a ton. If we've got $50 in depreciation interest, are we going to have a profitable haymaking operation? No, we haven't included fuel. We haven't included fertilizer. We haven't included our land rent. We haven't included our labor. 
we haven't included repairs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, this is just depreciation and interest put on a per ton basis. So let me explain, just give you a scenario, show you how this works. So let's say we, all we're making is 100 tons of hay with that equipment. So again, that would be what, about 200 uh, five by five bales. I'm gonna argue that for, for you to have a profitable cattle operation, you're gonna have to be feeding less than two tons of hay. Probably no more than one and a half. Again, it will depend on the situation. So that's probably what? That's probably a 70 cow operation or something in there to make that amount of hay. Um, so if you draw a line over to the left, that looks like about $28 per ton. That's how much depreciation interest we have in, a, on one, in one ton of hay, if that makes sense. Now I want you to see what happens. So let's say we're at, a, at 90 days there and we, cut, and we decide we're going to feed less hay, we're going to reduce our stock rate to do it, and we're going to feed 45 days of hay. So we only need half as much hay, right? We go down from 100 to 50 tons. What happens to our total fixed costs on a per ton basis? They shoot up, right? Now it doesn't double, and the reason it doesn't double is part of depreciation is fixed and part is, is variable. In other words, and I won't go into details there, but, but the variable por portion, will, you will get rid of that, but the fixed portion depreciation, are you getting rid of? No, it's still there, you're just dividing it by what? Less tons of hay. So in other words, if you're making your own hay, even if you've got really, really high costs, you're not avoiding the full cost of, of that production. Does that make sense? You're not avoiding a big chunk of the depreciation and all of the interest. And the difference there looks to be how much? About $24 per ton in that scenario. In other words, you're not avoiding that $24. You're still gonna have it in your operation. So to give you an example how that works, let's say your total hay production costs are $100 a ton, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna avoid that $24. So what you are gonna be able to avoid by reducing your hay usage is, is the difference, $76 per ton, and that's where you'd start. That would be your, the, the cost that you're gonna avoid, then you'd subtract out the nutrient value of the hay as you're feeding it, and that would be your net hay cost. So just as an example, we start with 76. Let's say that we're getting $16 a ton in terms of nutrient value. What would your net hay cost be there? $60 a ton. Does that make sense? I'm doing that for a reason because you can have outrageously high hay making costs, but it's not necessarily going to help you to reduce hay use that as much as you think it is because you're not going to get rid of the, most of those fixed costs. They're still going to be there. So what's the only solution for this farmer if they really want to reduce all their hay making costs? They're going to have to buy what hay they need, right? And I agree with Jim on that, by the way. Most small farmers cannot afford to have hay make, make equipment, or at least good hay making equipment. I know a few that have, they're moderately, you know, they've got 20, 30 year old equipment um, that's really not depreciating much. Now the repair costs are gonna be a little higher, so you gotta balance that. But, but for most small farmers, if, if you're under 100 cows, you can't afford to have much hay making equipment and make it pay. There's just, I've, it's not gonna work. All right, so if you're producing your own hay, what I would recommend, now first of all, most folks, I, I agree with Jim with this also, most folks do not know their production costs for making hay. So they don't know if they're at $100 a ton, they don't know if they're 150, they don't know if they're at 80. So if, if you're in a situation like that, if you make your own hay, I would recommend that you just use somewhere between $60 and $80 as your final after you subtract out that net nutrient value. Most folks are gonna be in that $60 to $80 a ton range. And I don't have time to walk through lots of examples, but that's just what I find. Now a few caveats here, and, and Jim isn't here, but these, these Jim is here. Excellent. Well, you're hiding, you're kind of hiding there. I was, I was gonna throw some stuff in there, but I guess I gotta be careful now. Um, so this is one for Jim. So the results that you just saw here, these are only for that Eastern US, so from the 100th Meridian East. And the reason being is out West, now you know I don't have cattle out West, but my understanding talking to people that do, you could, your forage quality isn't going to decline so much from spring to fall to winter as ours is. In other words, we can't, the, what we grow in May, we can't stockpile that until December because the quality's gone. My understanding is you can do that a whole lot better. So in other words, um, anyways, so the results here are not really, they're not, they're not applicable to the West. They're applicable to this area, and, and probably they're not applicable to Florida, Georgia, those areas. They're probably more here in the Upper South, probably Southern Indiana, Southern Illinois. Um, 
Another caveat here is, is there is a possibility of using that spring surplus uh, if, if you're using hay. So let me show you what I mean here. So let's say that we're in that 60 day hay feeding window. This is how much total hay that we need for the, the herd. So about close to 40 tons. Could we make 40 tons on a 100 acre farm with our spring surplus without reducing stocking rate? Very easily. If, if you dedicate what, just 20 acres, two tons the acre, which you should, if you've got good management, you should easily do, you just took off what? Just surplus on 20 acres. I, could, I would argue you could probably do a whole lot more than just 20 acres. So we could easily use our spring surplus, and if we're smart and we do what Jim tells us, we get a custom operator to come out to do it for $40 a ton. I just got really cheap hay, didn't I? Real cheap hay. Uh, what about 90 days? Eh, 70 tons, we'd have to have, what, 35 acres or so to do that. Might be able to do it, but I'm, I'm guessing we're getting to that borderline where we're, we're taking off too much of our surplus. And probably our performance can go down a little bit by doing that, would be my guess. Um, other caveats here, so the next two will, will really help zero or, or close to zero feeding hay. So I'll, I'll combine them. So drought risk and pasture health. So these are two things we didn't really look at directly here, so we're going to look at them indirectly right now. So I'll give you just kind of a comparison here. So let's say we're comparing 60 days to 150 days. And this is a good year, so pretty much every, everyone here, I'm guessing, experienced what in, in August and September? A drought. So which, which of these two farms is going to run out of pasture quicker in a drought like we had? One with 57 cows, right? They probably had, had to start feeding hay in, if it was in Anderson County, in, in early August, right, in that situation. Whereas if we're stocked for 60 days of hay feeding, we may have got all the way through the drought before we had to start feeding, right? Now, think about pasture health in those two situations. So that farm that started feeding hay in early August, now if they had good management, they got the cattle off, off the pastures, or at least confine them into small sections of pasture, hopefully bale graze at the same time to, to, so that, that the rest of the pastures. But if they didn't, if they let cattle have access to the rest of the pastures when they ran out, what happened to all those pastures? They got grubbed down to nothing, right? And when the rain came here in the last month, how much growth did they get? Not a whole lot. What about the farm stock for 60 days? If they just, if they kind of rationed all the way through, even if they had to start feeding a little bit of hay, my guess is most of their pastures are in still good health. And whose pasture is going to come back quicker when we finally got that rain? The 60 days. So both from a drought standpoint and pasture health standpoint, um, I would argue that we probably want to shift everything down just a little bit, at least from the high stocking rates. Once we get down below a certain point, it, we're probably not going to have to worry about the pasture health so much. So what I would recommend, this is, this is just my gut feel, but if those tables tell you to, to be at the 120 to 150 hay feeding days, you probably want to drop it just a little bit to account for pasture health and, and drought management. My guess is 15 to 30 days, somewhere in that range. That's just my gut feeling. I, I, I haven't actually analyzed it in detail. So in other words, this is where I come back. Remember I, I changed a couple things. Remember I dropped this? That's why. In other words, to account for soil health and drought risk, I'm going to drop that from 120 to 90 days. Just to, does that make sense why I did that? And the same thing at 60, I dropped that one, and then we, we looked at the overlap. So right now in, in kind of our current market conditions in terms of profitability and hay prices, what's the most profitable amount of hay feeding days? You got the table. Again, where I think most people are probably in that middle range. So probably 60, 90 days. But you can use the table to figure out, you know, based on your, your situation, where you should be. Now, does this, so any questions up to this point? And we're perfect on time. All right. So is that going to change over time? So is it always going to be 60, 90 days for that? Answer is no. Why not? What might change over time? What prices? But you, you've got the table of just hay price, right? Which one don't you have? Cattle prices, right? In other words, overall profitability. So let's go back. 
So let's look at four years from 2007 to 2010. Now, 2007 was the first year I got in the cattle business. And I, I just ran stocker cattle for the first five or six years, so I was buying calves. Um, I was buying cheap calves, but I was selling cheap calves when I sold them, so it didn't really matter. Who here w was selling calves during those four years? Were, th were those the good old days in terms of prices? Those were not good old days, were they? They were the bad old days. So I went back and looked at prices here in Kentucky. Um, th these would be for 500-pound steers. So somewhere just a little, th this would be for selling in the fall. So if you're spring calving, selling in the fall when prices are usually depressed, you were getting a, about a dollar a pound, a little bit. So prices look pretty darn good right now compared to that, don't they? What about 2008? A little bit lower, actually under a dollar a pound. 2009, about a dollar a pound. 2010, those, those were kind of, the, that was the worst year. We, didn't, we weren't really happy with the check that we got if you're selling calves. Why am I doing this? Would the stock, would the ideal number of hayfeeding days maybe change back in this era? Profitability was really what? It was really, well, let's go back to our, our bird's eye table. So we had low profit, and actually not, we didn't have low profit, we had what? Really low profit. So in that situation, it may not just be the high hay cost, maybe the low hay cost that we want a really low stock. In other words, even if hay was cheap back then, calf prices were so bad, that we still may not want to have fed that much hay. So I actually went back to, to look at this. Now, I adjusted prices down. So in other words, that was a few years ago. Our total costs were a little bit lower. I adjusted those down a little bit. But I essentially did the same type of analysis. So in other words, this is based on profitability during that era. All right, let's start with $80 per tonne. So with really expensive hay, I think it'd be no surprise. Are we going to want to feed? Where do you think we're going to want to be on that table? With really low profitability and really high priced hay. We're going to want to be towards the bottom, right? In fact, what was, what was the best? Where would you want to be according to that table? Right at zero hay feeding days. Uh, what about mid-priced hay? Answer is you still want to be somewhere down near zero, feed, zero hay feeding days. That was most profitable during that era. What about cheap hay? Answer is you still want to be somewhere close to zero hay feeding days. Actually, it didn't matter too much whether it was zero or 60, but it was all about the same profitability. Now, does that mean in any of those scenarios we made 10,000 or we made 7,000 or we made 4,000? No, it just means compared to our other alternatives, we did a lot better. Let's compare it. So let's start with a $60 per ton hay. The difference was how much. So if, if you had a neighbor across the road on that same 100-acre farm, you were doing how much better than they were? $7,000. Now, does that mean you made $7,000? No, they probably lost four or 5000 You made two or three, right, based on that scenario. Now, this is when it gets fun. What about 80 really expensive hay? Your neighbor probably lost what? Seven or 8000 You made two or 3000 now, folks, that's on a 100-acre farm. That's a, I mean, that's a major difference in, in terms of profitability on a 100-acre farm. So back in 2010, where would you want to be? What, what, what would you want to be targeting back in that era? Somewhere around zero, you know, zero to 30 hay feeding days, depending exactly on your situation. What about 2019? The answer is it's changed, right? What worked in 2010 isn't necessarily going to work today. Same as what worked in 1970 for haymaking equipment doesn't work for now. doesn't work today in terms of haymaking equipment. So for most folks, probably in that 60, 90 day range. All right, and we're just about, so that's it for the presentation. Um, questions? All right, well, you got all the information you need in terms of tables. Yeah, there's some additional things, Bill, that like if you use annuals, that will change a little bit. Um, but that's the extended version of this presentation. Let's keep breaking